Okay, Danny, before we get started, um, I think our viewers would like to get to know you better. So we're going to play a quick game, okay. a Halloween game, Two Truths and a Lie. Can you tell us Two Truths and a Lie, Danny? Okay, let me have a think. Um, okay. I played drums for a band called Hieronymus Bosch. That's number awesome. one. I have a brown belt in karate. Okay. And I once ate a sandwich with James Bond. Ooh. And I have to guess which is the lie. Hmm. Now, I have a purple belt in karate. So oh. I think that's achievable. That's very achievable. Okay. Not I think the band Hieronymus Bosch is so awesome, it has to be true. I think you didn't eat a sandwich with James Bond. Well, you're wrong. I oh! Won, I once, because uh, I used to do uh, radio interviews, and I did a radio interview with James Bond, or Sean Connery, as he's probably better known at the time, and uh, he said, why don't we have a sandwich while we're sat here? You know, so we sat there and had a sandwich <laughs> and did the interview. So, yeah, the, the lie is the brown belt in karate. I have no belt at all in karate. Oh, well, get, get working on that. <laughs> yeah, will do. That leads us nicely into The Witching Stone, which is a perfectly chilling Halloween tale of witches, ghosts, an ancient murder, and a mother desperate to see her son once more. And there is the beautiful cover. Hold, hold it in front of you. It disappeared into your background. There we go. There we go. Lovely. It's got historical touches, humorous beats, and jump scares, which will make sure you never walk confidently past a witch's grave ever again. That's correct. Uh, are you often inspired by real places, real stories, and histories? Yeah, uh, quite often, particularly in, in historical books. And this is it's unusual. This is a contemporary story. And what happened was that I, um, I, obviously, as Danny West and I, covered quite a lot of different subjects. And um, it occurred to me that I'd never done anything about witchcraft. So I started researching the subject, as you do. And I chanced upon the story of Meg Shelton um, and read, you know, that her grave is actually in a church in Wood Plumpton in Preston. And of course, that immediately rang a bell. And I thought, a witch buried on consecrated ground? That doesn't sound right. Uh, and then I became fascinated with her. Uh, and then I read about the local myth, the little legend that if you walk around her grave three times and say the words, I do not believe in witches, uh, she will come after you. And I thought, I thought about all the kids over the years who must have taken that on as a bet, you know, as a dare. And nothing ever happened, of course, because uh, witches don't exist. But I thought, what would happen if in one instance, just one time, a boy says the words and it really happens. And I thought, mainly, how awkward that would be for a teenage boy to be followed around by a teenage witch. And that's where it stemmed from, really. So you visited the actual grave? Well... I'm almost ashamed to tell you that I have only visited it virtually via ah. Google Earth because I, mean, I live in Edinburgh. At the time of writing, I didn't have time to actually go, so I took a virtual visit, walked virtually around the graveyard and all that kind of stuff. I thought, uh, when I get a chance, I'll go and actually visit the place. And of course, things have changed dramatically since then. We can't go anywhere, so it um, hasn't happened yet. But it's okay, So when you do visit it, mm -hmm. will you risk it? Will you do it? I, I quite happily say those words there. Yeah, I, I have to tell you, I, I really don't believe in, in, in ghosts and, and witches. I mean, they're wonderful fictional devices and it's great to have fun with them. But I, I, no, I, I don't believe in the supernatural, if I'm honest. Ah, oh, interesting. See, I'm one of those people who I technically don't believe, but I would never do a Ouija board. I would never walk around a grave saying I don't believe in witches. I won't say candy man, you know. <laughs> kind, of yeah. kind of kind of hope for the best, prepare for the worst kind of attitude, I think. So are you generally a fan of horror fiction? Yes, and uh, horror movies in particular. And, and I suppose that to make this point is that I, I feel my work is much more influenced by films than it is by other books. Uh, I'm, I'm a, a movie fan from way back. I mean, I review films from my site, bouquets and brickbats, it, in those times when you can actually go to the cinema, you know. Um, and um, so I, I've always thought of books as head movies. I, I see it playing out like a movie screen in my head. 
And um, so, yeah, all the kind of, I, I like to try and create scenes, I like to try and put people into the movie in my head. And that's really how I approach a book. That's how I've always done it. Yeah, that's how I do it as well, I think. Do, do you have any favourites, any favourite scary movies? Oh, so many. Um, I suppose, you know, <laughs> it's one thing about, about the, the which you says it has jump scares in it. Um, I, I think jump scares are really hard to do on the printed page. And maybe there's, there's a way of doing it. I mean, I, I could, uh, three films at random. Um, and if you ask me tomorrow, I'll probably pick another three. But I, <laughs> I'm thinking uh, the film Carrie, which is very famous. Oh, he has yeah. a final scene where she's visiting the grave and, and shoots up. Uh, and it's perfectly timed. It really makes you jump out of your seat. And that was one of the first films, I think, that, you know, where the jump scare became a big cause celeb. Uh, going back earlier than that, though, there's a film uh, by Val Luton called Curse of the Cat People. And that is just a scene where a woman is walking through a park at night and she senses she's being followed. And um, just at the moment when you think something's going to jump out, a bus pulls up and the door's open with a big hiss. And it absolutely makes you jump out of your seat. It's beautiful. <laughs> Scare. And the third one, I guess, really classic Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. And it's the scene where a woman goes into, Timmy Hedron goes into the house, uh, and there's an old fellow who sat against the back wall. And the camera takes three very quick, literal jumps one, two, three, closer and closer. And by the third jump, you're much closer than you want to be. And you realize that his eyes have been pecked out. It's a really freaky little scene. And I'm not usually a huge fan of Hitchcock, but I have to say, that's one of his most effective scares. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And so you use some of those techniques in your own writing? Try to, yes. And it, and it really is about, it's about timing, I think. You have to be very lean with what you say and just enough. And it's always that, that thing of making the reader aware of mounting tension. Something's going to happen. And then you always try and time it just when they're not expecting it and it's very hard to do that but I mean uh, as I say there, there are three or four um, jump scares in The Witching Stone which are I mean, absolutely designed to make people jump and then of course uh, as it moves on it, it actually becomes funnier I think I hadn't actually planned it to be quite as funny as it is but I, as it goes on I think it's a very dark humour laced through the book yeah, there was almost, um, I felt, sort of a Roald Dahl-esque sort of, the witch is almost sort of twist to it. You, when you have the um, the bed and breakfast owner, bless her, yeah. who, Please. you know, you sort of set up as she's not a very nice person, but her life just gets worse and worse and worse and worse and she ends up covered in boils and all these awful things happen to her and by the end i was just feeling so dreadfully sorry for this poor woman um but i imagine child readers would have would have a much less empathetic sort of response to her in a way Did you a intend her to kind of be the butt of this this joke yes because it's in a way i mean she um typifies if you like the traditional view of what a witch looks like and as the book goes on it gets worse and worse and of course this this poor woman who it turns out actually is rather nice and has a heart of gold you know um and and her all through the book it gets worse and worse until you think oh the poor woman she doesn't deserve this and of course the actual witch when we meet her is not like that at all because one of the things i wanted to do is to destroy this sort of outmoded concept of the witch you know this evil woman um and of course, we, we discovered that, you know, that Meg is in fact, if anything, a victim, somebody who's been wronged in her life. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that she's dead because, you know, she's, she's, she's in a grave. I mean, her death scene was absolutely just heart-wrenching. I mean, it, and not something that I've seen before. Um, really, anywhere that that the death that you came up with for her, without giving any spoilers away, is that something that you've seen historically happen? Or um, sure, I mean, there were very brutal times. You know, it was 1705 she died, and um, you know, what's interesting about Meg Shelton is that we know so little about her. I mean, it, there's lots of conjecture, lots of myths, lots of stories that are built up around her. The actual facts 
are quite sparse. But what is apparent to anybody is that the, the reason given for her death is nonsense. She's said to have been crushed by a rolling barrel in her own house against a wall. And you think, hmm, that, that, that's not really very likely, is it? So, of course, that got me thinking about conspiracies and of what might have happened behind the scenes. Um, so it was fun. I mean, in a way, that, that did free me up because not that much is known to invent quite a lot of stuff. Um, you know, and to play with the story. Uh, to try so and... the 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 story of the death that comes from the real Meg Shelton. That's the historical. That's the historical, yeah, uh, explanation for how she died. Nobody can explain how she came to be buried on the consecrated ground because, as we know, uh, a woman who was accused of witchcraft at that time would have been buried at a crossroads with no marker to to say where she was. Um, so. Yeah, of course it makes you think, well, how, how on earth was permission given for this to happen? It's, it's, it's absolutely unprecedented before or since, you know. Yes, absolutely. So, so you had a lot of fun changing the historical elements into your fiction elements. Yeah, I mean, uh, not changing them, but just adding things, extrapolating things. There were rumours at the time you know, of, of things that might have been happening. And I don't want to give too much away because we've got to leave some surprises in the book. But, Absolutely, uh, yes. But it's, but it's clear that, that powerful people were involved in her death for her to be, you know, to, to make the, the exception, say, oh, we'll put her in the church, you know, in the church ground. And which did you enjoy writing more, the contemporary stuff or the historical stuff? Um, well, it's just great to have that blend to be able to cut backwards and forwards. Uh, it's more usual for me if I, you know, to, to place a story in one time frame and leave it at that. But I just thought this one, you know, I, I, I'm one of those people now who, um, when I begin a book, I never really know where it's going. I think the term is a pantser, isn't it, these days? We call it a pantser. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I mean, back in the day when I first, I mean, I've been writing for what, 43 years? I've published for 43 years, I should say. So um, back in the day, I used to plan everything out meticulously. But now I much prefer to start the story, get a couple of characters, put them in a context, and have them, them give me the story, if you like. And it kind of develops. And it's not until I'm getting to the final third when. I hit something I call the tunnel, which is where I can see along the straight tunnel to the end of the book and I know where everything is going to go, how it's all going to tie up and where everything is going to be tied up and finished off. And um, I experience that now. So, yeah, um, I, I kind of like that feeling of just, you know, let's see where we go with this. It's quite exciting, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't have dreamt of doing it when I first started and certainly not for the first all. Oh, they say the first 10 books of the Hans, don't they? And after that, <laughs> the rules change. So you would recommend that any young people wanting to write, they, 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 they don't do what, what, what Danny does, they do plotting. Yes. They plan yeah, their story it, it, out. It's serious about doing a, a story or a book, yeah. I, I, I would say, you know, get 20 short paragraphs representing roughly 20 chapters and just have those as something to refer to. When you get to the chapter 10, you might have to rewrite the next 10 because things might have changed as they go on. But I mean, I think it's very important to have some kind of a, a format to follow initially. So what other tips would you give to young horror writers? Um, well, the old one, I mean, we've heard it a thousand times. Everybody says it's show, don't tell. But it's absolutely true. If you tell somebody about something that's happening way over there, it's dull. Um, you have to put us in the in the point of view of the character. This and we see through that character's eyes what's happening. And then, of course, use lots and lots of description. The more you paint a picture with words, the more it will come alive. Uh, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to transmit what's in here to the heads of the readers. And if 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 we see a a tiny thin fellow who's six foot tall and they see a short plump guy who's four foot tall, something's gone wrong and that's because you've not described it enough. So it's all about description. What about anything horror specific? How do you do your jump scares? How do you make those effective, for example? Because in film, of course, you, you have 
you know, music that you can have, you can, um, you know, have the character approaching and you can change the atmosphere and you can do a lot with film. How can you do it with a story, with a book? Well, again, I think it is putting the reader in a vulnerable state of mind that you have to make them feel that this is happening to them because you can't scare people if they're not involved enough to be scared. Uh, and then, you know, you, you, you place them in the context of the story. They are kind of living it with you as, 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 as they read the words. And that's the only way you can effectively scare people. Uh, and again, it's, it's also, this is another tip, I think, that don't show too much. You know, there are, there are some writers who show you every little detail and then it just becomes a bit gross and a bit yucky. Um, the less we see, in a way, uh, the more scary it is. I always think of, there's a wonderful film called The Innocents, um, which is a, a version of Turn of the Screw. It has a 12 certificate these days. It is a terrifying film. It's one of the most scary films I've ever watched. And mainly because it doesn't show you very much. It just gives you this awful atmosphere of this house where this haunting is taking place. And there are two young kids there who clearly know more than they should. And all of that builds up to this feeling of utter dread. Uh, and it's so effective. It is effective. And things happening to children are the big the big thing, isn't it? I mean, the reason the turn of the screw was called the turn of the screw, screw is because Henry James said that having the terrifying things happening to children adds an extra turn of the screw. Yes. So your child characters, there's a boy and a girl in your story. And I thought the girl was just this awesome kind of kick-ass, very realistic female yes. character. Which did you prefer writing? Well, Who was your favourite character? Uh, it's funny you should say that because um, obviously Alfie, the boy, is, is the main protagonist. But I've found a, a trend developing in my books where um, that it's often the female characters that they meet up with who are the motivators, the ones who move everything along, the more powerful, if you like, of the two. And I, I quite like that. Um, I think Mia, uh, funny, to me, a, a writer friend of mine the other day, gave me the compliment to say, I think Mia is the best character you've ever written, which is a lovely thing to say. Um, and I've written so many characters now, and you know, it's hard to remember them all. But um, I, I think she is, yeah, she is somebody who's never at a loss. She's the one who solves all the problems. While Alfie wanders around saying, oh, what are we going to do? I, I don't, and she's well, we, we'll do this, and we'll go there, and we'll try this. And I do like that about her character, you know. And, um, yeah, often, often, I don't know where this comes from, often my male characters are a bit ineffectual. I wonder, I wonder what <laughs> influenced that. <laughs> and I love how modern she is as well. So, you know, she's, she's making money from t designing t-shirts and having them printed up on places like, I guess, Redbubble and things like that. And yes. it's, I kind of worry that the older I get, the more out of touch I'm getting with young readers. And, you know, my daughter speaks a language. She's, she's coming up for 15. I have no idea what she's saying half the time. How have you managed to keep so in touch, I guess, so, so, so aware of what a young modern girl would be like? Mm. Do you have well, kids of your own? Or? I have a daughter. I mean, she's, she's uh, 27 now. Um, and, and she's a, she's a writer too. She's trying to get her first book published at the moment as we speak. Um, uh, and it's great. I mean, I, I mean, I, I, all I can do is offer advice and stuff, but I, I think she's, a, she's just a gifted writer. But, um, but I mean, so obviously, as I guess, you know, she, she's not exactly a teenager, but I do remember her teenage years really profoundly and everything that went on. And I suppose that helps. And, um, you know, I, I just try to stay abreast of things. I mean, I'm, I'm ancient now, you know, I'm, I was born in the middle ages, but um, yeah, I, I just think that you have to try and stay in touch as much as possible. Um, so I try to do that. I, I, hopefully, you know, characters like Mia are, are working. People seem to be responding to her really well. Mm, yeah, she's excellent. I mean, Alfie's great as well. You know, Alfie was so sweet and mm. all these dreadful things happening to him. I yeah. thought at one point that they were going to accuse him of being a witch. <laughs> yeah. Did but you think about that happening? That I, I, did, I did think about it, except that, you know, this is it's, it's, set, it's a contemporary story. That doesn't tend to happen now. But, uh, I mean, I, I have noticed that all of my, um, nearly all of my young male characters, they're always... They're often people who are out, a fish out of water. That's the word I'm looking for. Is it? 
they're, they're in a strange environment. It's a place they're not familiar with. They may just have arrived there and they're struggling to go forward. In Alfie's case, he's, he's, he's had this awkward split up with his girlfriend. And so I know it's all there to make um, readers feel sympathetic towards him, to be, oh, what a shame for him. I hope it gets better for him. And of course, <laughs> what tends to happen in the Danny Weston books, at least the things get worse and worse, you know, and they, <laughs> they get, find themselves plunged into an awful pl uh, place where they, they struggle to escape. And what about the adult character in it, the, 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 the lady that helps them out? Is she based on anybody that you know? Uh, no, she's not, not particularly. I mean, she's one of those, I suppose she's, she's basically that, that librarian type. You know, people often slag off librarians, and, but I think they're wonderful people. They are a host to a fount of knowledge. It's there at their fingertips and everything. And, you know, often in a situation where what you need is as much information as possible, Hannah is a great person to have on your team. Absolutely. And is there anything, that, so we've established you don't believe in witches and magic, but, if you could cast a spell on anyone this Halloween, who would it be and what would it be? Well, it's going to have to be some major politicians, isn't it? It's going to I was going to say. Be, <laughs> it's going to have to be Boris Johnson and Donald Trump uh, to cast a spell on them to magically transform them into caring people who care about the poor people in society, the dispossessed, those who are struggling, and particularly, and this applies to us especially, those of an artistic bent. So those people who are artists and musicians, poets, um, the whole writers, like us, you know, uh, help us out, you know, because a world that's deprived of art is going to be a very, very tragic place. And when all this is over, and it will be over eventually, um, people are going to want to go back to how it was. I mean, I love the theatre. I can't go to the theatre. I love the cinema. I can't go to the cinema. I love restaurants. Even that's impossible at the moment. You know, but all those things, um, they need to be supported for the times when this awful thing is over. We can go back to some kind of normality. Absolutely. That's a really great answer, Danny. So I guess that's all the questions I have for you. Is there anything you particularly wanted to say about your novel that I've missed? Uh, no, I, I just think that, you know, the whole point of this is I wanted to walk that perilous tightrope between scares and laughter. And it can be done. done in films. I think a film like American Werewolf in London, for instance, which does it perfectly. I mean, I can't think of a better example of something that has you screaming one moment and then laughing your head off at the next. And that's really what I was aiming for with this book. Um, it's an entertainment, uh, but also I hope will make people think about uh, the way, I mean, you just have to compare the way that Meg was treated uh, to the way that Alfie's uh, ex-girlfriend is treated in the book later in the story to show that things have developed and come on quite a bit since her time. Uh, and to stop thinking of witches purely as these, you know, these evil hags that, I mean, they were never that. They were women who were accused, who were, you know, oppressed, if you like, by the, 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 the times by the the male uh, dominated times and who were exploited in a way it was very easy if you wanted something from a, a woman who's perhaps good with herbs and things we could I wouldn't mind that bit of land she owns I'll denounce her as a witch I'll say I saw her walking with the devil and it's all sorted you know so yeah it's time to rethink that and I, I try very much here not to give a hackney view of what a witch is or was yeah and you absolutely succeeded thank you very much danny thank that you. was really really informative and very interesting thank you Brian. so um if, if it's <laughs> i'd like to mention my own book if that's all right um, Chat, because that leads it's me very more. important that we do because i've heard good things about this but i've not had a chance to see a copy yet or anything but i love the title raising hell Raising hell, yeah, absolutely. Um, because there are spells and uh, and magic in my novel as well, um, and it's very much uh, a, a book that will be out next June, I think. Next June, okay. Um, but but would be a great Halloween read as well. So it's uh, about a girl called Ivy, who she and her friends do a very stupid thing. Uh, and now there's a rift letting dark magic, dark matter into the world in the form of dark magic. Um, and suddenly 
all of these spells have started working and any teenager with access to the internet can start raising hell literally um and ivy's doing her best to stem the tide uh, but her new job working in school security doesn't pay the bills and uh, there's only so much one girl with a machete and a talking cat can actually do to stem the tide of evil that's coming into the world so uh, she's going to face a teenage goth with attitude a dark cabal with a terrifying agenda and a zombie apocalypse so uh, <laughs> that sounds very much my kind of thing i'll look forward absolutely to lots going on in my new novel so do look out for that one as well but obviously buy Danny's first, read Danny's first, and enjoy Danny's first. <laughs> Great to see you. You too, Danny. Really lovely talking to you. Cheers.